The Psychiatric Association wants to add internet addiction. Internet use disorder would include emotional shutdown and withdrawal. There are many horror stories in the age of online gaming. The HBO documentary Love Child looks at a South Korean couple whose child died of malnutrition while they poured their attention into their online child in Prius Online. If you look up phrases like gaming death or gaming extreme addiction, you will see many dark tales of people committing suicide or killing others in relation to an online game. Most recently, tabloids have been reporting on a 15-year-old decapitating himself with a chainsaw after losing in an online game. Just this year, the World Health Organization added gaming disorder to the International Classification of Diseases, describing the disorder as gaming takes precedence over the interests of other daily activities, despite the negative impact on their lives, with symptoms including changes to physical, social, and psychological health. Online gaming is a rather modern event. It is both in the early stages as a cultural phenomenon and field of study for anthropology. Tom Bolestorff is one of the most influential figures in the field of digital anthropology. But his book, Coming of Age and Second Life, only got published in 2008. So we only have a decade of digital anthropology canon thus far. Evidently, there are very few ethnographies of the internet so far, and even fewer have been published in mainstream anthropological journals, as said by Stockel. However, one consistency among anthropologists for approaching the virtual is the idea that internet communities cannot be generalized as one whole. Bolsdorf and others argue that the internet is an interesting to study as since different tribes, or rather cyber communities, inhabit the internet as if it were a real space. Which means, like real communities, one ethnography about an internet community is not representative of all cyber communities as a whole. Because of this, I will be examining the teamwork aspects within a Warframe community, but not as reflective as the online virtual experience as a whole. This teamwork can include a clan, a group of players who share a dojo and materials, working together to make their dojo more advanced, or how players work together to complete a mission. This can also include the social solidarity presented by Golub, elements of teamwork in a mission when players work together without much verbal or physical interactions. It would be difficult to do justice to the world of Warframe without giving it a visual context. This is why I have chosen to do a visual essay to help reinforce my experience within the game. These recordings also acted as verbatim field notes, which I share with my interlocutors, and only recorded with their permission. Part of the problem is that when people hear bad things about online games, they have no context for what these games are actually like or how they are experienced. I can tell you a game is violent, but showing you how the game mechanics works helps understand the violence in the context of the world. It is also difficult to demonstrate what a team looks like in Warframe without showing it. Since other players move so fast, it would be difficult for me to only take written notes, as a lot of context for mission situations would be required. I have also chosen to present my final ethnography as a visual essay to give back to the Warframe community. Beyond the game itself, players engage with the game through watching Let's Plays and Warframe-specific YouTube channels or Twitch streams. Through use of visual ethnography, I can justify using the videos of Quite Shallow and Better Name Pending from YouTube, as they are popular voices within the Warframe community. It is less likely people who play Warframe would want to read a 10,000 word essay about the game than they would want to watch a 20 minute visual essay. So the visual aspects are also about engaging in the relative audience who have helped me create this project in the first place and giving back in a popular medium. Tom Bolestorff started his ethnography by paying homage to Malinowski, repeating the same lines from his ethnography. Imagine yourself suddenly set down, surrounded by all your gear, alone on a tropical beach close to a native village, while the launch or dinghy which has brought you sails away out of sight. You have nothing to do but start at once on your ethnographic work. Imagine further that you are a beginner without previous experience, with nothing to guide you and no one to help you. This exactly describes my first initiation into the fieldwork in Second Life. This is often the case with how traditional ethnographic fieldwork is presented. 
This is the very romanticized version of early colonial anthropology of a white man in a safari helmet venturing into the wilderness to discover an uncontacted tribe. It is also a literary technique. This slightly romanticized arrival invites the reader to experience it herself, to become the anthropologist, as Bouchetteau says, and immerse the reader in the story, even if it paints a very colonial white man in a grand adventure story. I would argue Bollestorff's reuse of Malinowski's arrival story is not reflective of the player's arrival story into many online video games. In the case of Warframe, I was introduced to the world Medias Res. In video games, there is a concept of a cinematic cutscene which acts as a short movie before or intermittent of player action. All players get the same introduction when they start Warframe, a cutscene of the Lotus's voiceover telling you to awaken as the Grenier find your cryo chamber. It establishes that Vor, a Grenier commander, is evil with his disgusting features and his immediacy to kill even his own henchmen. The Lotus wakes um, you, the Tenno who falls weakly to the, from the ceiling and collapses on the ground, trying to get their bearings. Vor tries to capture the Tenno, but the Lotus intervenes and overcharges the Warframe to kill the enemies. This is when the cutscene ends. I was suddenly given control of this foreign character. I chose Mag of the three options and had to quickly learn to survive. This is called a tutorial level. It is more forgiving than at later missions and quickly teaches the players how to play the game through action. The Lotus is the guide of this. She speaks inside the head of the Tenno and appears in a window on the screen and guides us through to safety. When I started, I was slow to learn. The controls and camera movement perception of the player must be learned anew, like driving a new car. There is a degree of disorientation like waking up from a dream and having to snap into a stressful situation quickly. I don't, did not really have a chance to take in the environment or other negligible factors when I was focused on the gameplay. In my field notes, I recorded the situation like this. I am still not at the point where I am interacting with other players, on missions or in general discussion. I am still very much bumbling along by myself, getting lost even when guided by a map and having non-playable characters, NPCs, politely remind me repeatedly what I am meant to be doing and where I am meant to be going. It is fascinating to have my helpful MP NPC guide, Lotus, leader of my tenal alien species, have her faith put in my character to bring justice to the destroyed. But I cannot remember which button activates my melee attacks. This was back in April when I first started playing Warframe. I hardly recall any of it now. The muscle memories of playing the game on a keyboard are now so ingrained in my brain that I struggle to remember the difficulty of learning it the first time. Failing to remember how to use melee, which is one of the most crucial parts of fighting, is now instinct to me. The actual swift speed of the game is also quite overwhelming when first starting out. The game has a very high frame rate, almost cinematic, that my computer wheezes every time I load it up. Your brain has to adjust to the quick movement and explosive visuals while also learning the ropes. I have found watching recordings of me playing the game gives me mild motion sickness given how quickly the camera moves. Jarvis recalls a similar disorientation when starting the game. I had no idea what was going on. I had to ask my friends for everything and they had to me craft a bunch of random weapons and spam Draco, which it used to be the best place to gain experience. And then we just boosted until I was at mastery of rank 13. When I was finally able to engage with other players, including Jarvis, I experienced the same sort of boosting in which Jarvis and his friends carried my low level character through high level missions in order to level me up quicker. This is a common tactic among friends who play Warframe together. The first time I did this with Jarvis, however, I felt a little ashamed that they had to do all the heavy lifting for me to gain all the benefits. In my field notes, I recorded this experience of doing a 32 to 37 level mission while I was a level 4. It was complete and utter chaos from my perspective. The imagery was borderline epileptic, and before I could understand what was going on, I was already dead. My death was signaled to the rest of the team, who would zoom to my position and bring me back to life. Very kind, giving I had nothing to offer in support of the mission. Jay suggested I stick close to the team, but that was difficult due, the, due to their enhanced speed, making it look like they were on roller skates and I had moon boots. 
The mission for the first time with people I knew made me feel like a burden. Until that point, I had only done the tutorial by myself. Jarvis assured me that this was standard boosting that friends did for one another, and he had done it in the same situation when he started. It was difficult to see how we all started in the same place when he and his friends looked so adept by then. In the beginning, I was also much more emotionally invested in NPCs as well, given they were my first pseudo-social connection to the game. During this time, I had to do a hostage rescue mission, and I was very worried they would die before I could save them. Upon getting the Tenno hostage out of their cell, I treaded slowly through the map, making sure the uh, hostage kept up. At this point, I did not know the hostage could spawn to my character if I got too far away on the map. Early on, I was also given a choice to save a bunch of unseen colonizers or extract from the mission early. The NPC Lotus warned me that it was a greater risk to try and save them, and that it was my choice for what to do. I died once trying to save the colonizers, but did succeed, noting in my field notes that the game is fake and there are no real-life consequences for not saving the colonizers, but I chose to imagine what I would do if this was real and I was a superhuman being. I like to think I would try and save other people rather than just myself. We can see I am still negotiating the reality of this virtual world and trying to displace myself from the environment to reclaim an outside perception. Yet I still chose to risk my character's life for the unseen colonizers based on my own moral compass, even if I had no emotional connection to these unseen NPCs. Following in the steps of Tom Bolestorff, participant observation was key to my virtual ethnography. He argues that digital ethnography is an indirect field of study that crucially is predicated on participant observation, rather than elicitation methods such as surveys or interviews. With participant observation in a virtual setting, there is a duality of interaction between yourself, technology, and other players. Golub suggests that virtual worlds are a multiple participant environment, both in terms of other players and the technology we connect and interact with. When doing participating observation in a virtual world, it is just as necessary to interact with the environment as it is to interact with other players. The environment includes non-player characters, NPCs, the storyline, the mission maps, and all other elements that help build the facade of a functioning living realm. At first, I struggled to put myself out there to interact with other players beyond Jarvis and Brendan. My assumptions about the cruelty and callousness of other infamous player groups, such as Call of Duty gamers, made me afraid of being mocked or harassed. Most of the time I did not interact with the general trap, but observed sometimes. My main interactions with other players came from team missions. Teams could consist of one to four players working together to reach an extraction point. Some mission types require more teamwork than others, such as interception requiring everyone to guard their post from invaders. The options to communicate directly with your teammates was either to use audio chat, which I heard only used twice in my entire time playing, or to just type a message in the team chat. Team chat was rarely used in the heat of battle unless urgent, or at the end of a mission when many players would type GG or good game or thank you to celebrate completing the mission. Part of the reason for lack of chatting is the difficulty of fighting while typing a message, and also because these missions are not heavily reliant on team coordination. Golub does not see this type of gameplay as antisocial, but rather as social solidarity among players working together without a strong social interaction. The second part of participant observation within virtual worlds is the allowance of immersion into how the world works. In the case of MMORPGs, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, in order to fully participate, you must treat the environment itself with authenticity. I would not be getting the full experience of Warframe if I did not engage with the environment and ignored the storyline. Dasein is Sartre's concept of combining being in oneself and being for oneself. This is related to the factual existence of a human and the predication of events that will become part of the factitiousness of that person. Sartre's understanding of existence as located in a particular human being is based on that being's relationship to contingency and by extension to nothingness 
as said by Kleinberg. Imagine a video game where Dasein is the hero. While this rock biome is simply being in itself in an inert solid state, Dasein is in himself in a different way. His facticity, the givens of his situation, once set, are fixed. The character's sex, race, skill level, the fact that he was at Helgen when Alduin attacked, all make up his facticity. He is in himself. But at the same time, Dasein is being for himself. There are still quests he can complete, or choose to ignore. There are skills he can improve, there are dragons he can slay, there are buckets he can place on shopkeepers' heads. And in doing these things, in stealing food and killing bandits, or even just standing around and admiring the scenery while he heals, the being for itself slowly annihilates being in itself, changing Dasein's facticity. Sartre calls this being in situation. And as long as Dasein is in the game, he's always playing. As a conscious individual in a situation, Dasein is always in the process of making a choice. In Sartre's famous phrase, we are condemned to be free. This is a very existential subject, but it is important for consideration of creation of being in video games. There is being in myself in terms of the predicated facts I have chosen when I started the game. I chose to be Jelly Belly Biz, the Mag Warframe. And then there is being for oneself, continuing perseverance through the game. I can always level up my character, do new quests and missions, or I cannot. This is all dictates my facticity and alters it. I began as a low-level mag, but through action I am now a level 30 Valkyr Prime. However, I can choose to not do any of this. There are constant choices to be made, and this is Sartre's idea of freedom. It is my choice to pursue the missions, follow the story, and interact with the environment as a legitimate realm. And this is what is necessary for participant observation, treating the virtual world with respect and continually pursuing missions and the overarching storyline is participating in the world. However, participant observation also requires a self-conscious balance between intimacy with and distance from the individual we are seeking to understand, as Hume and Mulcock say, and this is the distance where I struggled. As time progressed, it became more difficult to separate myself from the game and examine the field site as an anthropologist. As time tracks, my field notes became less descriptive of environmental and social aspects. And sometimes I did not just want to take notes and enjoy the game without thinking. Bordeaux has noted this in his own work. The inherent difficulty of such posture has often been noted, which presupposes a kind of doubling of consciousness that is arduous to sustain. Despite this, participant observation was absolutely crucial for fully understanding Warframe's environment and social aspects that could not be comprehended through interviews or surveys alone. Warframe is a difficult game to understand without experiences of the gameplay, and is for the same reason that I have chosen a visual essay, to allow viewers to understand the game visually as I experienced it. What became clear is that there is a lot of different modes of teamwork within Warframe, and the characters that players choose could have a major impact on the positivity or negativity of a team. Given that the game is not heavy on coordination, I refer back to Golub's idea of social solidarity among players in World of Warcraft. WoW is similar to Warframe in regards to the repetitious grinding required to mine certain components for weaponry or Warframe parts. This is often done with a group of other players, whether chosen by a random public team-ups or by your clan members or friends who seek the same components. In WoW, raid encounters are high-pressure, emotionally intense, ritualistic activities in which players learn to repeatedly perform the same actions in a more or less identical way in a coordinated manner in order to kill a boss, as Golub says. Relic farming is the most common way I did it. Um, in which we had to do a mission to open a relic that would produce a prime component from a pool of six randomized items. Rarer items had a lower chance of dropping. In this case, relic farming is most effective in a team because upon completion of a mission, 
all players could choose their own relic um, reward or their teammates' relic. So playing in a group meant a better chance of getting a rare component. The stakes are dependent on the goal, and the higher the stakes, the more tension there is in a team if everyone is not pulling their weight, or if it is perceived this way. Jarvis and Brendan both discuss the worst teams to be on if you are trying to do farming of experience or for certain components, and one of the teammates is hindering you. Like you said, you do sorties by yourself, which is like the harder one. Doing it by myself, I find it more cons- consistent. I don't right. have to be concerned with someone else not pulling their weight. Right. Mm-hmm. If you know what I mean. I had the Especially the spice sorties. <laughs> You prefer I, I preferred playing by myself because I didn't want to let other people down when I was new into the yes. game. And I started taking on oh, sorties. Yeah, there's a the difference between when I was new and sort of. I originally started playing back in 2014 with a group of people, and that was right. exclusively with that group of people, pretty much. Oh, okay. Um, and then, yeah, I had a whole hiatus for a long time until. Until so I like abandoned, we all play Warframe again. Yeah, and then <laughs> since then, I've basically just been. Um, no, no, it depends on what I'm doing. Yeah, I do all the, uh, obvious, for obvious reasons, I do all the missions by myself. What are you I doing? I need this for you to do. You need the gun. <laughs> <laughs> if it's something that's difficult. <laughs> Finally, you have the gun. Yeah. Like, if it's difficult to do on your own, or if there's an advantage to having more people safe for XP farming. Yeah. But I don't know something that someone else can possibly screw it up for you. Right. Like spy sorties. That one is the one that gets me the I most I just do them with my power and just... Always do spy sorties by yourself. Okay. Yeah. Keep in mind that weaker teammates are not always disliked. And in fact, Jarvis and I have both been the weakest link at some point among friends, where our friends were helping us level up quicker by allowing us to leech off of their experience. However, under these circumstances, the stakes for the whole team are quite low, it is usually with sta- um, strangers that these stakes are raised, whether feeling pressured to be useful or fearing that you will be a weak teammate. Jarvis said, I solely play by myself except for XP farming, or if I ask him to play with me. And Brennan agrees that playing by himself is more consistent, like I don't have to be concerned with someone else not pulling their weight. In my own experience, I prefer to play with a team for the most part. Sometimes I am the strongest player, and sometimes I am the weakest. It depends on who I am randomly paired with. I feel I get more out of game with others, both in terms of experience and success rate. Only with Spy do I prefer to do it alone, because I am not good at Spy, and I am a burden on a team if I set off alarm and we all fail the mission because of me. I do Spy alone, so I can take my time, and if I fail, I am the only one affected. The best teams are ones that are well-coordinated and quite equal in skill level. Only rarely have I been on teams where one player got so mad that they rage quit, as it is called colloquially by gamers. In this case, they did not believe the rest of the team was pulling their weight, and we failed the mission. I was not a strong member of this team and repeatedly died until I used up all my lives. What becomes clear is that there is a great chance of toxicity within a team if it is felt by players that other team members are not pulling their weight, such as the case Jarvis experienced. Before I get to my mirage and explain her, mm-hmm. what is a bad team look like in Warframe? And that's, that, like, what's the worst team you've worked with that you can remember? Because I've had people rage quit on me in sorties and they get mad. Team in terms of composition or play style or... Um, well, that's what, what, what do you think matters in making a bad team? One experience I'd like to um, have. Hit, hit us up. Okay, so um, <laughs> I was doing some XP <laughs> grinding, right. and I was playing Nova, and right. generally with Nova, her ultimate ability, you can make a large board, you speed up all the enemies, they make, you make them run all into the middle, and then you become really weak. When you shoot one of them, they blow up, they can trigger other people to blow up, and right. you just get through the mission really quickly. And mm-hmm. someone saw me just standing there. Doing the ultimate ability. I was actually speeding up the game, but I didn't. Hey, this is it? Yes. Making it easier for everyone, but um, most of the teammates didn't understand what was going on. They thought I was just leeching. And uh, they were all, they all brought weapons that were good enough to kill anyone anyway. So they just uh, came to leech anyway. So were they low and, levels? Uh, 
something like they're like 12 and, and, eight, enough, that and like enough that you'd think hey you should have like a gun that should be able to kill people in the 30s easily yeah yeah i don't know um they ended up leaving they blamed me because oh you're looking at me and i i bought my old boss which was rank 30 so i was running around slicing up everyone anyway and <laughs> <laughs> One problem other online action games have faced is called griefing or trolling in which the players try to intentionally hinder a team. Bolesdorf discussed griefing in Second Life as when residents acted up to disrupt the experience of other players and typically involved the resident verbalizing malicious intent, engaging in additional antisocial behavior, or repeating the act after being asked to stop. Griefing, or trolling as it would be called more commonly in modern times, does happen in Warframe, but the design of the game itself does make it difficult to be, for it to become a serious issue. Players cannot swear in the chats and there is no friendly fire option, so they cannot harm their teammates. It is only through primarily lack of action that we see trolling in Warframe, such as players joining a team but doing no damage or aiding to complete the mission. Do the Tenno sleep? Yes, they do. Way too often. God damn it. In my case, I did not experience any intentional griefing or someone trying to hinder a mission. However, Brendan made me aware of issues with Loki being able to swap places with other players, which can be frustrating, or Frost slowing down bullets. Whether these are intentional griefing incidences or accidental is hard to tell, given that these, warf these are Warframe abilities. Jarvis, however, does recall an incident that was clearly a player griefing. Um, you see people playing Limbo and Loki and stuff who are, who are just... They're pretty good frames if you want to leech, because you can just stand there and not get shot or not yeah. get damaged and stuff. So in the, um, the tech follow up, I'm going to that so wrong. Yeah. The moment. Um, I went up with Mesa, and there was a Loki there who was just standing there invisible the whole time. <laughs> Did 0% damage. <laughs> Didn't kill anything. <laughs> So I'm sitting there with Mesa shooting everything, and he's just standing there doing the yeah, shooting. Yeah, so that's kind of the two sides of it. Yeah. Um, people are being deliberately a pain, but it's not. It's difficult to be too much of an ass. Yeah. yeah. Griefing almost that was. Yeah. Nice. Despite some incidences, griefing that impacts the overall experience of the game for another player to do is quite difficult to, and rarely done. More commonly, teams experience tension based on power imbalances in the characters. Leeching or being underleveled for a mission means the rest of the team must carry the weight of this player, and there, this is where the conflict begins. However, the same dynamic can also be used for players wanting to help other players level up quicker by carrying them through a mission. It is about what the team's goals are that create the tension regarding power imbalances. If you are helping level up another player, then the imbalance is expected. But if you are trying to achieve a different goal, this imbalance becomes an issue. As Jarvis explained, there are certain frames that aren't particularly good for certain missions, while others are designed for certain mission types. And this plays a crucial role in the dynamics of players working in a team in Warframe. The game has 32 unique Warframes that a player can build. They all have set abilities, strengths, and weaknesses. For instance, Ivara is a Warframe designed for stealth and marksmanship. She is best for spy missions, as she can pass by the sensors unseen. But she is not the best for missions that require her to do full frontal fighting like defection. A joke among Jarvis, Brendan, and I was that Rhino is the perfect Warframe for every type of mission, as this is Jarvis's favorite Warframe. And his abilities always benefit the team, according to Jarvis. I jokingly asked Jarvis if he thought an entire team of Rhino Warframes would be efficient, and he was sure it would be a great team, despite no diversity in abilities. But this is not the case for all Warframes. I have come to learn, as I have come to learn, there are support frames and there are disruptive frames. And which Warframe you play can have a big impact on team dynamics. Brendan argues that the first important thing is that Warframe doesn't have any traditional roles like tanks, healers, DPS. Any frame can technically do any content, and few frames don't have some sort of team support or ability buff. 
In theory, a team can work regardless of the characters the players choose. However, Warframe does still have support frames, a concept put forward by the developers when classifying different Warframes. Warframes like Oberon and Trinity can heal teammates. Nova and Ember can crowd control by reducing health and strength of enemies. And teammates like Rhino and Volt enhance the strength of the team. With the exception of Trinity, most characters are meant to have broad enough abilities that they can function in any team dynamics or solo play. But support frames can help with the difficulty of a mission. However, you, how you play is just as important for the effectiveness of the Warframe as the support for a team. For instance, Jarvis uses Rhino in all circumstances as there is no situation where Rhino is not helpful. While Brendan believes there are plenty of frames that are fantastic sports supports as well, just in different ways, and there is no singular Warframe that defines support frames. It is all about how they are used in a team situation. My own experiences support Brendan's as I have struggled to act as a support frame with the characters that are often associated with this role. A restriction on my exploration of support frames was that I did not have the components to create Trinity, the quintessential support frame as suggested by Brendan and other members of the Warframe community. This hinders my understanding of her value for teams. Instead, however, I experienced with Oberon in an attempt to play a supporting role for a team. My experiences prove that players have more significance as a support than the characters itself, as I struggled with this role. I tried to heal and protect teammates with my abilities, but it never seemed to have much of an impact on the overall game. Brendan, however, worked well with Oberon when I played with him, but I did not even notice. He informed me after that he had been healing me without my noticing. However, Brendan and Jarvis are part of a larger Warframe community that have a distaste for the Warframe mag. Oh, come on. Good. Now mag fans gonna stomp through my comment section again, like a pack of confused dysenteric elephants. Listen mag heads, I have nothing against your foul gang of sexual deviants, okay? You're free to enjoy, whatever Warframe you want. Everyone has an opinion, but mine is right so fuck you. Mag, aka male pattern baldness in Warframe, is a 12 out of 10, on the scale of ugliness. She was one of the first Warframes to be added into this game. Because of that, her crimes against humanity span almost half a decade. The hating of Mag as a Warframe is a foremost a joke, but the character does have a stigma given her unbalanced nature. However, Mag is the only Warframe I feel I can successfully play as a support with. She has the ability to restore the shields and diminish the armor of enemies at the same time. I constantly use this ability to aid myself and teammates, especially in the case of defense missions where I could restore the shield of the chambers we were protecting. Mag is not categorized as a support frame by the developers or by much of the larger Warframe community, but how I play her is what amplifies her abilities as a supporting teammate, just as how I play um, impacts Oberon's value as a support frame, despite his association with this type of teammate. Hello, today is a Friday. It's also the 13th day of April, so naturally, we are going to summon Void Demons. For this, you will need to equip Penta as your primary and Gram as your melee. The Warframe has to be the most terrifying and evil Warframe in the game. Limbo. Jesus Christ, it's scary already! There are Warframe characters, however, that are associated with disruptive playing. This is not the same as griefing in which it is intentional, but rather their abilities, when used in a certain way, make them a hindrance on the overall experience of the team. In some instances, a player can think they are being helpful with their abilities, but in reality, they are hindering the experience of other players. One example is Frost's ability to create a snow globe that slows down enemies' bullets and bullets that enter it. But this also slows down his teammates' bullets, so they cannot shoot enemies who are in the snow globe. 
like some frosts think they're being helpful by putting snow globes everywhere, <laughs> slowing down the people, but really turns out you just can't do right it. there and you're right here and you can't shoot them. They can't shoot you, so it's kind of cool, but yeah, it'd be helpful to get rid of them. Um, that's right. <laughs> they could be doing something. Communication is a necessity among teammates. In this case, in order to ensure the Frost player understands to refrain from using their abilities in certain circumstances. Any character can possibly become a nuisance for a team if they overuse their abilities and ruin the fun of the game. But there is one strongly controversial character for a team play in Warframe and could be considered a disruptive frame. Limbo. No, Limbo no fine. <laughs> Limbo, one of the worst visually designed characters in the game, one of the worst designed characters in the game period, and, on top of that, an object of religious adoration to the most annoying bunch of top-headed snobs to ever proclaim a master race since the British Empire. Thanks to his ability to phase into the Chinese room reality and become invincible, Lembo turns most of the game into fun free walking simulator. He can force other people into his seizure inducing reality as well, massively increasing his damage against them. Which turns Battlefield into confusing mess, because, of course, you can't shoot through the cataclysm, or attack banished enemies, since they are locked in the grey world, absent of joy. Lembo can do a lot of damage but he makes his team suffer as a result. Mirage can do damage just as efficiently, but without annoying her team with the retarded cataclysms popping up everywhere, like pimples on the face of a Limbo fanboy. Limbo is associated with antisocial players given his abilities are very solo player oriented. He can take enemies into another dimension where his teammates cannot shoot them, and if his teammates accidentally enter the rift with him, they are trapped there for 15 seconds or longer because they cannot jump between the two worlds like him. He can also create a dome like Frost that slows enemies, but it can be frustrating for teammates who cannot shoot outside of this cataclysm dome. In one instance I played with a team that had a low level limbo on it who kept creating these domes and other players continually asked him to stop because it was annoying. But the limbo player did not understand this. Limbo isn't as bad now but I don't like the players who are associated with him, Brendan explains. Limbo has been reworked to be less disruptive in a team, but there is a stigma associated with players who like Limbo because he is a Warframe designed for solo missions rather than teamwork. So the assumption is people playing Limbo are being antisocial if they use him in a team and take away from the experiences of others. Despite general community jokes about Limbo and the stigma surrounding the character, when playing Limbo I found he was very useful when I needed to do a mission by myself. But in a squad I rarely used any of his abilities. I found his abilities shine the best in a team when another player was down. There is a bleed out timer before a player has to use a life to revive their character unless another teammate revives them. There are times when I could not safely save a teammate if they were still in the crossfire without dying myself. But Limbo can heal people from the other dimension without taking damage. This made him a reliable lifesaver for a team. It, go ba it goes back to the idea that the categories of disruptive and support frames often blur, and is more about how the player uses these characters. Teamwork in Warframe can be anything from holding an elevator door until all the teammates are in, to heading into the crossfire to revive a fallen teammate. Teamwork in Warframe, however, does not necessarily involve coordination or consistent verbal engagement in order for a squad to work effectively. The concept that came to mind many times while doing this project was Golub's concept of social solidarity. Teammates can work together to reach a common goal without looking like a social group. Teammates are also not expected to reap equal benefits to one another. Some will gain more experiences, points than others, or different resources based on the individualized nature of team missions. A multitude of factors could determine the positive or negative dynamics in a team. 
mainly down to style of play. Players who were low-level could be perceived as leeches for joining missions beyond their league, but other times they were playing with allies who were carrying them through a mission to help them rank up quicker, a tactic I used with Jarvis and Brendan, and they did when I first, when they first started out too. The Warframe themselves could be a determinant of the tensions based on how abilities were used and overused. Disruptive players could either intentionally use their abilities to grief, but more commonly, they thought they were being helpful when in reality their abilities were hindering the experiences of other players. Limbo is often part of this discourse, as his abilities can be used in a very antisocial manner, hindering his teammates and stealing kills. I did, however, find he does shine as a Warframe when a player needed healing and he could heal them without getting injured himself. What is clear is that playing Limbo correctly in a team made him effective, but overuse of his abilities would hinder the team experience. Warframe is a legitimate social and play experience. Tom Bullesdorf worked to justify Second Life as a legitimate field site, and I build on that by examining the social and playing aspects that cross over between the virtual and the real with Warframe. I can turn off Warframe in a way that I cannot turn off reality, but still finds its way into my discussions with friends, just as we discuss the real world while playing the game. These different realms of existence are unique places, and Warframe is not subservient to reality, but there is such crossover socially between the digital and real world. Video games are often associated in the mainstream with antisocial behavior. However, my experience in Warframe shows a different side of online gaming, a place where players work together and support each other. This may not always be clear at a glance, but there is social solidarity in these teams, even if the players are not directly talking to each other. So y'all really dropped the ball as soon as I have 12% of the damage.